Build Show friends, welcome back. I got a great video for you today. Not about anything specific, but lots of good things. We're at my house under construction. This is the real rebuild project. And if you've been following along, I've had a lot of fun, but it's taken me a while. I'm about a year in plus uh, on this project and I'm just hanging sheetrock. I took some time off for COVID uh, to try and make sure I knew what was going on in the world. But we're back on track and I'm actually hanging sheetrock this week. So. I thought I'd walk you through and show you a few of the details that I did that are a little bit different, a little bit cool, a few of the products. Today's build show, all about my real rebuild right before drywall. Let's get going. Hopefully you guys saw my James Hardy video. My siding absolutely looks fantastic on this house. And I've got a future video, I think, on my garage, but let me show you a couple details that are not gonna be readily apparent after I get into sheetrock. First off, I think you probably understand, I've got living space above here. Let me back up a little bit so you can see it. So my boys' bedrooms are up there at those windows. There's a hall bath. And so we walk into the garage. Um, this is just roof right here. But here, I've got living space above, which means that to meet uh, current codes, I'm under the uh, 2017 uh, IRC, International Residential Code, 20, sorry, 2015 IRC, I need to have a fire um, barrier between the house and living space, which means that I need to sheetrock the ceiling. Now, I've never shown this in a video, but what I did was I used rock wool through most of the house, but I used a little bit of spray foam in this space because I wanted that spray foam to stick. But when I did it, I froth packed this part right here where it goes into the house. And I put some sheetrock up, just some strips first so that I could sheetrock, pardon me, so I could spray foam down onto that sheetrock. That's a great tip. Now in the rest of the garage, I got some cool plans. I think I'll actually make a video on this, but I'm not gonna use sheetrock on these walls or this wall, uh, and I'm gonna cover this, so stay tuned for that video. But one cool thing I did in my garage that I really have been excited about is I've used a bunch of Endura products, including this brand new product they're calling Fusion Frame. Um, so let's take a look at this. This is my door from the garage into the house. And what's cool about this fusion frame is that this is a split um, jam and trim material. And I took some video of this while the guys were installing it. Okay, so the next thing that I did from Endura was between my house and my garage, I used their really cool three-point locker system. What's happening is when the door locks, it's got multiple engagement points on the door. So there's actually one, two, three engagement points. And you saw how that blade was kind of curved. Let's see if I can zoom in on that. That curved blade right there means that when this door actually shuts, it's locking in tight and pushing that door up against the frame. So I'm gonna get a really nice, nice tight seal. Better security, of course, but the big thing that I cared about was a nice tight seal. I never got a chance to make a video on this. This is my, not this, this is my frame for my skylights, which I'll tell you about in a second. But this is a really cool water heater called a Sandin uh, heat pump water heater. And this is a split system. I should probably make a whole video on this, so maybe I won't get into too much today. But basically the idea is this stainless steel tank lives inside the house. And then see these pipes right here? These are pre-insulated Upinor uh, half inch PEX lines that run at the top and the bottom of the tank. And then my plumber did an amazing job of snaking those in one piece, no joints, all the way through this attic here and then down and out that sidewall. You can kind of see it right there. And what's happening is outside, there's an outdoor unit, which is gonna make the actual hot water and it's gonna send it to the unit here. And this is basically just a storage tank. The outdoor unit is a perfect spot in my hot, humid climate 
to get hot air or to get heat rather out of the air, dump it into um, this tank for holding and then I can distribute to the house. But uh, the COP, the coefficient of performance is crazy high. It's like around four. So the most efficient um, uh, heat pump water heater that I've ever seen. But the other cool thing about this is it can go quite hot. Uh, so much so that you've got a mixing valve uh, right here on the unit. And that mixing valve is gonna make sure that I'm not scalding anybody. Cause I'll probably set this thing at 140, 150, maybe even 160 degrees. And I wanna make sure that no one's getting scalded. Another thing that's happening is I've got an Upinor fin. I'll show you about that later, but that's going in this spot. And then I've got a pump, which I'm actually gonna cut in right here. Let me take one minute and show you that if you're not familiar. This is a Metlin Demand uh, pump. Uh, I'm just opening this box that I literally just closed yesterday to leave until <laughs> later, but I wanted to show you what was in here. Okay, so here's the deal. This little pump right here, it looks like a, you know, probably a taco brand pump, has a little brain attached and has, let's see if I can find it, a uh, thermocouple, here it is right here, that's attached to this little nipple right here. I'm gonna actually open it up so you can see it. So what's happening is we're gonna thread this on to the pump and now the pump is going to recognize temperature through its little brain. Here we go. So airflow, uh, pardon me, water flow is gonna go this way through the pump. And as the return loop on my house brings water back, this little thermocouple, which gets attached to this brain right here, will go, oh, wait a minute, the water's hot. I'm gonna turn the pump off. So this is in effect a hot water circ pump but here's the beauty of it. It's not circing based on a timer, which I don't like those because they waste water. You know, that's what hotels do. They put them on a timer, which means all 100 occupants of the hotel, anytime you turn on a faucet, is gonna get hot pretty quick. But at a house, we don't need that. You know, we're, we're gonna have many, many hours uh, at a time where no one's calling for hot water. You know, if I leave the house and the kids are all gone for the day, I don't want my timer going. And I also don't want some timer system that says, oh, every morning I get up at, uh, you know, 5 a.m., but I don't get up at 5 a.m. every morning. Some mornings I get up at six or I sleep in until seven on the weekends, uh, whereas a lot of mornings I do. Now, here's the cool part. The way that this pump gets activated is what I really like. They've got lots of retrofit options, which are Bluetooth, and that's what this is. That's also what this is. Uh, so this is actually a push button Bluetooth. There's a button. This one is a motion sensor Bluetooth. So you can actually go, oh, let's set this in the bathroom. When I walk in, it'll turn on. This one is more like, hey, I'm coming in. I wanna press the button and go. Uh, they also have wall mounted options of motion. So if you wanna put this, let's say in a kid's bath where they walk in, they're probably gonna be uh, using the shower and the tub area. They could use that. But this is actually my favorite. This is a wall switch. That's what they call a demand switch or a uh, momentary contact switch. That's what I meant to say, sorry. So it's only got one place to click. And when I click that thing, it's gonna click on the pump down here. When the pump's running, it's gonna, it's gonna light the light, so I know that. And if I click it and the water's already circed, it's not gonna circ it again because that thermocouple knows, hey, the water's still warm here. This is a really smart system. And in fact, I installed one of these on my current house um, 15 years ago, and it's still running strong. And back at that time, they didn't have all these cool controls. All they had was this, um, which is basically a doorbell button, which you, you can still use today. And I have this on the side of my vanity, this little doorbell button, which says, hey, momentary contact me and get me going again. And this will light, this will turn the pump on. Now this is the least uh, obtrusive way. And I might actually use something like this in my kitchen, but I'm gonna use these momentary contacts in my kids' beds. Um, good company, I know Larry, the owner of the company, 
Very, very cool people. And you can use these on both retrofit and new construction. So I'll, I'll, uh, I'll wrap some of this stuff with my sand and water heater, my Metlin Demand, and my Finn uh, water control system up later. But I'll put some links below if you're interested. Let me show you the next cool thing that I have not mentioned before. And they just literally got installed last week, of course, while I was on vacation. And that's these right here. I did a ton of research on which skylights to use, and I ended up deciding to use this brand. Now, this is a German brand called Lamalux. These are triple glazed skylights, meaning there's three panes of glass. They're thermally broken on, on the frame of the units, and the one particular unit is also motorized, and that's what this cool screen is. Um, this little uh, uh, brush seal right here is keeping the bugs out when the motor arm is extending it up. But man, the numbers on this thing are incredible. It's twice as efficient as anything I could find. It was the standard double glaze. Um, all kinds of different colors you can option for the outside. Very, very cool skylight. I got it from 475 Supply. I'll put a link to those guys in the description below, but uh, I've for years searched long and hard for anything besides double glaze because skylights uh, in this area of a house, really in any area of the house, are gonna let a ton of heat in or a ton of cold if it's a uh, cold climate. And having those to be really, really good glass makes a big, big difference. So I'm real excited about that. Well, I'm thinking about it, uh, this kind of TV uh, sizing chart is up here. What do you guys think? Uh, you know, working uh, on a full Sonos install for my house because I can bit, pretty much do it myself. But what do you think I should do? 65 inch TV, this is the, let's see, the TV is, the couch, the back of the couch is like right at the back of that sheetrock right there. So as you look at that TV, it's about 12 feet from the back of the couch. Should I go 65 inch, which is the smaller size, or should I go 75 inch? That extra strip there, that strip on the top, and actually this one fell, but, and that one right there would be a 65 inch TV size. Comment below, I'd like to know what you think I should do. A couple other things that I uh, wanted to mention, and this is really more of job site maintenance, but you know, before you get into the drywall phase, you pretty much need to clear the house out uh, and one of the things that I've been doing here at the job site, besides making videos, of course, uh, is job officing. And so I've got a mock-up for an island that I made, if you saw my cabinet video, which has turned out to be a great uh, little spot for everything. But unfortunately, I get HSS, which is horizontal surface syndrome. That thing fills up easily. This little folding job desk fills up easily. Uh, and I did finally get these out, but I had a sweet... Uh, low table that I made with these tough built sawhorses because they're fully adjustable. I really like that. Uh, and I had a sheet of plywood over those. I just got this out yesterday. I'm gonna set some of that up in the garage, but uh, emptying the house before sheetrock and getting everything out and finalized, what a, <laughs> it's a ton of work. Uh, so I've got a video coming up on putty pads and acoustic sealant, so I won't get into this in this, but I did want to mention these cool things that I found actually at the home center, really well priced, but I was looking for some access panels that I could get, and it looks like Odie makes these. I found them locally in a six by nine and a 14 by 14, and let me show you how they work. Let's see, I've got one over here. I'm gonna have to take this, take this light with me. But this is my pantry. And check out that sweet box right there. Hopefully the, you can see the light in here. I think we're okay. I need to cut this conduit down, but these, these boxes are super cool. You can mount them uh, with the flange up against the, the uh, studs like I did. And then that way the sheet rocker will come and just put uh, sheet rock to there. I need to redo my insulation in here. But then I'll put this access panel when I'm done. And then if I ever need access to that, I know exactly where it is. It'll be in the bottom of my pantry. The other option is you could cut the hole later, and I think that's kind of why they sell these at the home center for like, you know, if you cut access for plumbing and later wanted to do it so that the flange would be on the face of the sheetrock. But I'm gonna use these in a couple different places in my house 
including I think at the back of all my hose bibs. You know, I used Aquar hose bibs. They tell me they're about 25 year service life uh, before you might need to do anything to them. But I'm gonna put one of those bigger ones here where I've got a hose bib. I also put one here where I have an extra what they call D-mark wire uh, on the side of my house and I had to block over and I'm missing, I need to re-insulate this, but because I had to block over, maybe I should have done the bigger size, but either way, I'm really thankful I've got exterior insulation on my house. That exterior insulation means that I'm not super worried about a couple areas that might have reduced insulation. For instance, I've got some Sonos uh, speakers and Sonos uh, has a partnership with Sonance. So these in-wall architecturals are basically Sonnen's speakers, Sonnen's brackets that a Sonos uh, speaker will fit in. And this wire that runs to that Sonos speaker will go all the way back to my media cabinet back here, which has my Sonos amp. But as you can see, when that thing gets installed, it's like three and, I don't know, seven sixteenths inch deep. So it's basically taking my entire cavity no room for insulation. It's on an outside wall, but I'm not super worried about it because I've got, uh, you know, two inches of full depth exterior insulation on the whole outside of my house. So I was super excited about that, uh, knowing that I had a couple of those problem areas that weren't that big a deal. Ooh, a little dark in here. Let's see if we can see. I may have to grab my, my light. Oh, I got a flashlight with me. How about we flashlight it? There we go. This is kind of a bummer. This looks like a window in my, uh, in my bathroom, not a bummer. I should have framed this wall as a two by six wall. I framed it as a two by four wall. And once I realized that my mistake, it was too late. <laughs> you think I've been building long enough, I wouldn't make these mistakes, but I did. Uh, so with these openings here, I'm gonna be using quiet rock on the backside of that wall. And then these are gonna get some sweet row burn cabinets. I'll show you those when I do some uh, future videos on the bathroom. Uh, I'm also gonna make a future video on my Schluter system. I'm really, really pleased with their waterproofing system. Now I had to install this part early and I put a fake curb on it. It will be curbless later, but I had to do that to pass my flood test here in the city of Austin. Uh, but that's looking good. Oh, this is blocked. I don't know if I've told you about this. I have some uh, Mr. Steam towel bars that are a heated towel bar. That's a luxury I'm really excited about. Had to block for those things ahead of time. And let's go upstairs and see if there's anything else worth noting on the upstairs of the house. Man, those skylights are awesome, aren't they? It brings a ton of extra light, even at 8 a.m. on a cloudy morning. You can see how much more light I've got in here because of those skylights. Drywall guys are starting tomorrow. Pretty excited about that. All right, guys, a couple cool low voltage tips here uh, real fast. I'm doing Sonos at my house, but I'm doing some of their architectural speakers. And these brackets, which Sonance makes, which I think is actually a different company than Sonos, are really awesome. These are gonna get mounted up here where that speaker wire is. But here's a low volt conduit tip that we just learned. Andrew and I, I'm saying Andrew and I, Andrew Googled <laughs> and figured out, which I didn't know, not being an electrician or a low volt guy. But check this out. This is standard Smurf tube. This clicks on and is holding into the tube here. And then see those threads? Show us what you got going on, Andrew. We're gonna mount it down into this standard low volt box. And then this is just a ring that's gonna screw on there. And then once that ring is screwed on, that's gonna hold that thing in place on the box. So now it's not gonna move. Isn't that cool? And we're gonna put, I guess we could forget the pull string. It's not like it's going very far. And this is an Arlington uh, TV recessed box. There's a corner mounted uh, electrical outlet there. And then from the low volt panel to here, we've run a Cat 6E, a coax. This is power from the electrician. These are the two speaker wires that are running down to that box as well. I'm gonna have a low cabinet here that will have a Sonos amplifier. And then I'm using the Sonos uh, sound bar. It's called the Arc, which will be mounted uh, right below the TV. And then you can see those wires run overhead all the way to here. 
And the last thing we got to do over here is just install these two brackets and then we're good to go. But I thought those tips could be helpful to you. My daughter's bedroom's looking good. Oh. Yeah, I probably should make a video on this, but I'm doing some quiet rock and some specific soundproofing details on this wall between my daughter's bedroom and my boy's beds. Probably should do something on that. Oh, here we go. This is cool. It needs to be cut down, but this is the wire for my Metland Demand uh, system. So I'll cut this here. That keypad that I showed you, this momentary contact will go here. And this will circ the pump, which is all the way downstairs. All right, guys, that's probably about all that uh, I've got for you today. I really appreciate you guys coming out for uh, a quick real rebuild update. I'm making a video on blocking and last minute kind of preparations for drywall. So stay tuned for that video. I also have a good video on insulation. Not sure when that's getting published in comparison to this. But man, my house has been super, super fun. I'm a little nervous that I'm getting into drywall tomorrow that I forgot something. Uh, so much so that I actually had a huge zit uh, on my nose last week. I think all that stress was just coming out of my pores thinking, gosh, what did I forget? But I appreciate all your support. This reroll build project wouldn't have happened really without you guys encouraging me to video the process and talk about my personal build. Uh, and I've had a lot of great companies come on board that have giving me some severe discounts on products, which has been awesome. Uh, but guys, thank you for all your support. If you're not currently a Build Show subscriber, hit that subscribe button. You know, we've got new content here every Tuesday and every Friday. Follow me on Twitter or Instagram. Otherwise, we'll see you next time on the Build Show.